In this video, we're going to cover the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation. So by the end of this video, you'll understand how the concentration of ATP and ADP impacts the rate of electron transfer, the rate of glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. We're also going to break down the coordinated regulation of all of these pathways, focusing on where they all connect, oxidative phosphorylation. So let's begin this lecture recapping and summarizing glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the respiratory chain, showing the key enzymes, and then highlighting how the concentration of ATP, ADP, AMP, NADH, and NAD+, regulates these pathways. So in glycolysis, we oxidize glucose to two molecules of pyruvate. There are three key enzymes, hexokinase, PFK1, and pyruvate kinase. So hexokinase is stimulated by glucose and the hormone insulin, and it's inhibited by its product glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. And we discussed how fructose 6-phosphate does this in the regulation of glycolysis lecture. We also broke this down in more detail in that lecture. Now the next key enzyme is PFK1, and it's stimulated by AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and it's inhibited by ATP and citrate. The last key enzyme for glycolysis is pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase converts PEP, or phosphoenol pyruvate, to pyruvate. It's activated by F16BP and ADP, and it's inhibited by ATP, NADH, dehormone glucagon, acetyl-CoA, and long-chain fatty acids. So that's glycolysis. The pyruvate we've produced is then transported into mitochondria and converted to acetyl-CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is stimulated by AMP, ADP, NAD+, and calcium in skeletal muscle, and it's inhibited by ATP and NADH. So now the acetyl-CoA can enter the citric acid cycle by combining or condensing with oxaloacetate, and we yield citrate, and this is catalyzed by citrate synthase. So citrate synthase is activated by ADP and inhibited by ATP, NADH, succinyl-CoA, and its product, citrate. So citrate then turns into isocitrate, then alpha-ketoglutarate, which the next key enzyme here is isocitrate dehydrogenase. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is stimulated by ADP and inhibited by ATP. So from alpha-ketoglutarate, it's then converted to succinyl-CoA by the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. And this enzyme is inhibited by succinyl-CoA, ATP, and NADH. Then more reactions occur and we produce oxaloacetate, which can then enter the cycle again. So from glycolysis in the citric acid cycle, we produce and captured electrons in the form of NADH and FADH2. And NADH and FADH2 are important electron carriers. And so these electron carriers are going to donate their electrons to the electron transport chain, where it's accepted by the final electron acceptor, oxygen. Now, if you've seen the oxidation of glucose lecture, where we calculated the total yield, oxidative phosphorylation yields the most ATP aerobically. So now let's get into how the cell regulates this. How does the cell regulate ATP concentration? The cell's job is to be at a steady state, homeostasis. So they carefully regulate ATP concentration. So when we need energy, ATP is converted to ADP or AMP. So the ratio of ATP-ADP concentration impacts pathways and processes that require ATP and ADP. And this is the same for NADH and NAD+. Therefore, ATP and ADP concentration is a way for the cell to determine its energy status, okay? Specifically, the mass action ratio of ATP, ADP. And we can denote it as this ratio here. So the ratio of the product concentrations to the reactants concentration. So when our body needs energy, for example, muscle contraction, we're going to break down ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this will decrease the mass action ratio. As a result, we're going to produce more ADP. So the ADP and inorganic phosphate levels increases. 
and this will accelerate the rate of electron flow to the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation so that we can produce ATP again. So ADP activates the respiratory chain and ADP will also increase the rate of glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the citric acid cycle. So the key enzymes are glycolysis and the cycle. Because when we have high levels of ADP, our cells are signaling like, hey, we have low ATP concentration. So let's stimulate, let's activate all the pathways and the processes so that we can produce energy again. And this is what makes our cells extremely beautiful because they generate ATP when the rate of energy requiring processes increases, carefully regulating the intracellular concentrations of ATP and ADP. Now, on the other hand, when the body has increased the formation of ATP and also NADH, it's going to inhibit these pathways. So the rate of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, because ATP is an allosteric inhibitor of PFK1, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and the dehydrogenases of the cycle. Because when we have high levels of ATP, our cells are signaling like, hey, we have sufficient energy available, so we don't need to produce ATP. So let's shut down Let's slow down, inhibit all the pathways that produce energy. So that's how ATP and ADP concentrations regulate the flow of electrons and oxidative phosphorylation. Now there's another component of the respiratory chain, and that is the rate of oxygen consumption, because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. But let's take a look at how cells respond to hypoxic conditions, so low oxygen conditions. So here we have our electron transport chain, so referring back from the oxidative phosphorylation lecture. So when cells have insufficient oxygen available, the transfer of electrons to oxygen, the final electron acceptor, slows down. This affects the proton gradient, so pumping protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. The proton gradient is what activates the ATP synthase complex and produces ATP. And when ATP concentration significantly decreases, ATP synthase has the ability to hydrolyze ATP, so doing the opposite of its job. So instead of combining ADP and inorganic phosphate, it's hydrolyzing ATP, and it's going to push protons out. And this gives us a huge problem. But luckily, there is a protein inhibitor called IF1. So what IF1 does is it binds to two ATP synthase molecules. So we have IF1 here and it's going to inhibit the complex's activity. So it's preventing the complex from hydrolyzing ATP. And there's a cool thing about this IF1 inhibitor, and that is it only works best at a pH lower than 6.5. And so when there's little to no oxygen available, we can produce ATP anaerobically. But at the same time, we're also producing lactic acid. So lactic acid is going to lower the pH level and lowering the pH level is going to activate the IF1 inhibitor. And when oxygen is present again, the pH will increase and ATP synthase activity will activate and continue. So that is the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation. In this lecture, we learned how the concentration of ATP and ADP impacts the rate of electron transfer and how this impacts glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire metabolism playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!